Okay, we're recording. Uh, my name is Ben Frank. I'm the president of Wildcats Hockey Club, a uh, youth hockey club in Southern California based out of uh, Riverside and Carlsbad. We're a, a USA Hockey Model Association for our commitment to long-term athlete development and age-appropriate programming, as well as a proud partner of Positive Coaching Alliance, who commits to better athletes, better people. Um, our website is wildcatshockey.com. You can learn more about our club and uh, my own background as well. Uh, my profile is on there. And the purpose of what we're doing today is this is our very first uh, blab, and we're going to be hosting a number of these with different people uh, uh, based on uh, hockey player development, youth sports, sports science, and a bunch uh, anything that we can do to uh, really help us learn more uh, as a group and as a staff and uh, discuss some key topics and then share that with anyone out there that wants to participate along with us, with our own club and anyone that uh, shares the same interests. So uh, today um, uh, I have my our program director, Paul Esdale, joining us as our first guinea pig. He's going to be uh, participating in a number of these blabs, but today I'm going to uh, start with interviewing him on a few topics. Um, and uh, I think his uh, background and experience uh, will have some, some good stories to tell, and I think it'll be a, a good first blab for us. So uh, just to introduce Paul, he's our, he is our program director for almost four years now. He's originally from Edmonton, uh, Canada, grew up playing hockey there, um, later played at Brown University, uh, was an all-star defenseman there, went, went on to play professional hockey, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but went on to play professional hockey uh, for a number of years in Europe and uh, North America, um, and then went on after his playing career to be the uh, coach and head coach and GM in the BCHL for Port Alberni Bull Bulldogs, uh, where um, uh, he actually had, they had a, one of the best uh, education programs as a junior program, put a number of players into collegiate hockey. And then from there, made the transition over to a director in our youth hockey program. So welcome, Paul. Thanks for testing this with us today. Well, that was great, Ben. I, I sounds like a rehearsal. Oh, I've, well, a little bit. I, I, I had to brush up on. Brush up on. I'll do my best because I haven't had any practice, so I'll, I'll try to answer truthfully. Good. And um, hopefully, have some uh, some information that, to help uh, all of us get better. Great. Did I get your background right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly right. Uh, Alberni Valley was actually the team okay. name in, in in the city of Port Alberni. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely got my background right. And, uh, you know, thanks for that. Uh, First, uh, yeah. Wh why don't you tell us a little bit about the transition from uh, you playing pro hockey, then then coaching okay. in GM and junior hockey to jumping into youth hockey in California is, uh, is uh, obviously hockey, but it's, but pretty different there. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I've been around the game my whole life. So it really, it, you know, if I want to talk about this, I got to talk about where it all started. My dad was a career coach for 25 years. So, I grew up around the game. I grew up obviously in Edmonton, Alberta, which is a hockey hotbed, you know, during the eighties with the Oilers. So, you know, every day after school, I'd be out in the outdoor rinks and playing until, uh, until it came dark and then, you know, get back out there and go to the outdoor rink that was in my uh, backyard of my house too, till, till bedtime. And, uh, I was around the hockey rink a lot. I'll see around where my dad was, uh, coaching as well. A lot, a lot of times at the university of Alberta. So I was in the dressing room. I was on the team bus at times uh, around some kind of hockey legends. My dad coached with a guy's name, like Claire Drake, who's a legend in Canada, Bill, Billy Moore. So these guys all coached in the National Hockey League. Um, you know, they used to tell me stories of, you know, Mike Babcock, Mike Babcock of, of obviously the Maple Leafs now, uh, you know, watching their practices from up in the stands and taking notes. So I was immersed in the game, like it or not, as a young guy and, uh, you know, my experience um, with that, you know, ingrained that the love for the game and passion. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have a lot of great opportunities. A lot of people uh, believe in me and uh, obviously face some obstacles uh, trying to get to where I wanted to get to in hockey and face some adversity. And uh, the, getting back to the, the question, the transition, you know, from from playing to coaching is really challenging as you went through that as well, Ben. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's when you're playing, you don't realize how much goes into coaching. Yeah. And, and I still, you still kind of underestimate how much people actually do to be involved in coaching. And uh, the other side of it is also, you know, being a director of programming, the, the behind the scenes, the, the work on the computer, 
uh, you know, talking with people, you know, explaining the program is, is, is the hours and hours you put into to really do what's right for the kids. And, and that's where it stems from is, you know, grow up in, growing up and in, in seeing, uh, you know, University, University of Alberta, my dad and those, those, those coaches, what they wanted to do was they wanted to teach and give back to the game. And uh, that really what inspired me to when I went from playing to get into coaching and, and, and to where I am today is because of, because of how I was, how my environment was and how I was raised is I, I always wanted to give back to the game and felt I could in a way. And, uh, you know, you only can play the game for so long. Right. And, you know, to be, you know, lucky enough to, you know, obviously meet you through a friend of a friend and get down here. Uh, you, you know, it's been, uh, it's been able to, uh, be a, a real passion of mine and to really, hopefully I can make an impact with, with other kids and, and give them a good experience. When, when did you start, uh, you said that you had that, you felt that same passion to give back to the game that like that your dad and the people around you is when you were young had, when did you, was that something that you always thought when you're done playing that you wanted to do, or did you start thinking about that when you finished playing or that you wanted to stay involved in the game? When did that feeling start? Yeah. You know what, even when I was playing, I was, you know, in the summers I was working hockey schools and, and, and you know, skating with younger kids and, and that kind of thing. And always trying to help those kids. Even when I was in junior and college, I was doing that too. So it was just part of my, just kind of part of how I was raised and part of my nature was to, you know, help out the younger kids. And, uh, you know, obviously I was looking up to older kids too. And that was just kind of the part of the culture of, of hockey where I grew up was, was the sharing and, and being involved. And so that, that was ingrained in me at a young age. So, yeah. So obviously wanting to dedicate, as much time as you have and do back to the game, obviously you had to have a, a lot of passion for it even first as, as a player. And you mentioned the kind of growing up with your dad and around the rinks and around all these hockey people. And you're at, you're at the rink watching these guys. Is that something that from a young age, like you were, you loved hockey right from day one and you were, that was what you wanted to do. Or is that something that kind of developed over, over time as, as a youth, like, is that something that, you, did your dad push you at all to, to, to be a hockey player or did that kind of develop over time? Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, great, great questions. Well, I, 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 I developed over time. I think obviously when you're real young, you, 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 you know, you're just getting started there. And I, I believe it or not, I started when I was two. And uh, so I was a pretty young age, you know, and, uh, you know, being in that environment and being where I was from, it was, it was part of what you did, right? And, um, you know, there was, there was other parts of my life. I played competitive tennis and up until I was 19 years old. Um, but, but that, that love for the game was, wasn't pushed from my dad. It wasn't pushed from anyone else. It was, it was intrinsic. I, I, I love the game because I love the game. I love going out there and skate and play. And I, I was lucky enough to be able to play, you know, six to eight hours of pond hockey almost every day. Uh, you know, no coaches, no referees, uh, you know, no parent in, in, uh, parents around as much and uh, just letting the kids play. And as simple as that, playing the game, go in, warm up, grab, grab a Coke and uh, have fun or a hot chocolate, then get back out there. And, and there was kids from five years old to 20 with, you know, 30 kids in a, on a rink and a couple pucks or one puck, one game and just figuring it out. And that's, uh, I grew up doing that and that was that love. And I, you know, I, I also liked other sports, of course, but it was that, that initial, that pond hockey stuff that really got me into what it. What other sports did you play? You mentioned you played tennis. What other sports did you play growing up? Well? Yeah. So I, so the big part of my life was tennis. So what I, what I did when I was growing up is I'd play hockey for eight months of the year. And then, you know, during the winter in Edmonton, that was, that's, that's a long, you know, winter months. There's no, there's no sun or, or sun really much there. And then the, the other four months during the summer, I, I played tennis. And uh, so I would compete uh, at a pretty high level and became really, you know, a pretty good player. And uh, did you I, drop the skates? Did you drop the skates completely for those four months? Yeah, you know what? Uh, Earlier? Or? Yeah, when I was younger, yeah. I, I played I played a bunch of ball hockey and stuff. And, I, and I've talked to you about this before. I've grown up with uh, with a friend, Mike Comer, who played in the NHL. He, his family was lucky enough to have a – a mini gymnasium in, in their house with, uh, we played all these different small sided little ball hockey and roller hockey games. And, and growing up that obviously developed a lot of our skills and we played that almost every day too. Um, but playing tennis really helped me. I was also like to play golf, um, played soccer a little bit. So I, I was definitely into a lot of different sports. Right. And, and you're, uh, 
so you are growing up with your dad as a college coach and, and a career coach and things. Did you ever feel your whole youth career that you felt like you're at any point that you had to play for him or that you were doing something for him with your own hockey career? Did you ever feel like you were like he had, there was some kind of expectation or or anything like that from your dad as far as your playing career? Yeah, well, I think I think um, the expectation was that I gave him 100 percent whenever I stepped on the ice. And, and that was really it. And. And as long as I was enjoying myself and, and going as hard as I could um, and, and acting in a, in a positive manner towards my teammates and that kind of thing and, uh, and, and had a good attitude towards uh, my elders, um, then I was doing the right thing and he was happy for me. I, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I remember when I was you know, younger playing tennis and tennis is obviously a, a very uh, challenging game and a middle mental game and, and you're by yourself and on your own. And I remember, I think I was 14 or 15 where, uh, you know, I, I had a trouble controlling my emotions. I was very competitive. Um, and, and, and I, and I was hard time making handling, making mistakes. Yeah. And I remember, you know, breaking my racket over a, a court or something one time or something, you know, which is not appropriate, you know, or, you know, same thing as breaking your stick over the boards or something like that. And, uh, I remember being in the front seat of my dad's car in tears and he, he took my rackets away from me in the summer. So I, you know, I, he, said, this is not, you know, we've had several, you know, had several chances to, to sort this out. And if you're not going to treat the game with respect, uh, we're going to pull it from you. Yeah. And I remember, you know, had like a two or three week suspension from him and uh, it was tough, but those are great lo- lessons that transferred over to hockey and handling, you know, adversity. And uh, so that was, those were, the, those were the interesting times, but part of, you know, what we call is life lessons. And I, I learned a lot and owe a lot to my dad for that. Yeah. It's interesting that, 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 that it, was, it was rather than you being pushed to compete or play, it was that if you didn't behave in a positive way that you didn't get to play, right? It was actually that that, that privilege was taken away rather than forcing you out on the court to do, to train or whatever, is that you wanted to play so bad, yeah. So emotional about but he but but that was that was the accountability was that you you know to to lose that opportunity, that privilege, right? It's an interesting because you stop and see that the other way, right? I think there's such a big respect for the game in our family and sports being a big, big part of our culture. And, and, you know, that was how we looked at it is it was, I was, I had the opportunity to play, you know, talking tennis. I, I had the privilege. I had the, I didn't have the right. I had the honor to do that. And that was, that was, uh, you know, coming from a, you know, middle-class working family where my dad had to, you know, my mom had to work for everything we, we kind of had in our lives and they did everything they could for their kids. That was ingrained in how I was raised. And that's, that's how we looked at it. Cool. I, I wanted to uh, get into a couple other stories too, that you kind of alluded to. Uh, the first one, if you could, uh, I know that you had an interesting story. Well, you mentioned growing up with uh, Mike Comrie as a, as a, as a friend of playing. And I know that uh, he was a smaller, smaller player, right? And you guys, you know, Edmonton's a hockey hot, but obviously he's played with a lot of good players growing up. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, um, if it, what even what, what you saw him go through as far as uh, at younger ages, people thinking about who the players that were going to make it on to the highest levels and, and things like that. And then maybe you could transition from there into one of your own stories as well about, uh, about sure. hockey. Yeah. So, so Mike, yeah, Mike was, you know, he, he, if he hears this, he'll probably be uh, mad at me, but he was always the small, you know, facts are facts, right? He was always the smallest kid when we grew up, right? And you know what? He turned out to be the best player out of everyone that we ever played with ever. Yeah. And there was always people that, you know, said he was too small, you know, not just teammates, you know, parents, right? Parents talking about 10, 11, 12 year old kid. Oh, he's no good. He's too small. He's this and that. And, and, you know, there was these other, you know, bigger 12 year old full grown peewees that were, you know, dominant players at that age. And, uh, you know, he was once one of those kids. What the best thing about Mike was, was he, he worked so hard and he was very competitive, right? It, there's no secret to why he made it to the NHL. Yeah. Cause he worked harder than everyone else and, and played more than everyone else. Yeah. And, uh, it's that, that's a fact. And he, you know, he'll, he'll probably would tell you that is that he, he played in his gym. He played outside. He played everywhere. He did everything. He played bubble hockey. He played. It was it was hockey, 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 right? And um, yeah, he took time off and stuff to, to avoid burnout and that kind of thing. But it was that love and passion for the game, and he worked just he worked harder than everyone else. And a lot of those other kids didn't. None of those other kids made it 
Um, well, well, a lot of the other kids, right, were pushed by out, out, outside uh, forces, right? Some people, some of the kids loved the game, but they also were pushed by their parents and were, were told how great they were and told how their parents were. And everyone was telling us how, how, how bad we were and how small we were and we could never make it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to transition into the, to myself and, and kind of when I went through is when I was in uh, Batham AAA, so 14 under, I, I was the top scoring defenseman on, on my team. And I was moving up to midget and uh, everyone, you know, we all tried out for the midget triple A team and, and uh, you know, all my friends made the midget triple A team, of course. And uh, he was transitioning to a new coach who didn't know me. And uh, you know, there's tryouts, there's 40 kids out there who knows if he saw me play the year before, I don't know. And uh, you know, basically, you know, I'm in a, after, after tryouts, he's sitting there with my dad who, you know, coached for 20 plus years then, right. At University of Alberta coach. And this, this coach tell, you know, tells myself and my dad that, you know, I just, I wasn't good enough and I was too small and I couldn't play. And uh, respectfully, my dad, you know, didn't, you know, interfere. You know, he respected what the coach was saying. Obviously, he didn't, he didn't uh, like it, but uh, we kind of took our medicine and uh, sat back and said, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? Is this, is this something that's going to break me? Is this guy right? Is this, um, is this game, you know, is this game too big for me? Uh, or, or am I going to bet, you know, or is it going to break me or is it going to bend me? And uh, I remember, you know, sitting back in that front seat of my dad's car again, where I was, you know, close to quitting hockey. Right. And, you know, looking back, it seems silly, right? Uh, one guy tells you you can't play, but you know, when 99% of your friends make that team and, and you were the leading yeah. scorer the year before, right? Yeah, and there was well, so it was tough. And, and knowing the program below it was, was not a very strong program. And, uh, you know, I went down there for, for a couple of weeks and it, it just, it really was a, was a, unfortunately that wasn't a great program. Um, obviously a lot of midget double A and midget A and, you know, those level programs are great programs at that particular time. It wasn't great. And, uh, so what happened just to finish the story was that, um, I was lucky enough, um, my dad who coached at the university of Alberta had a, a former teammate, uh, that was a offensive defenseman. Uh, named Gord Thibodeau, who was, who was actually coaching junior at the time out in Fort Saskatchewan, about 45 minutes away from where we lived. And, uh, you know, I was 16 at the time and, uh, you know, went through, hey, this guy's, you know, one guy says I can't play. It wasn't going to define me, right? And I, I really, really kind of fueled me, at, at, you know, once I got through the initial shock of it. And, uh, you know, I wanted to prove him wrong and prove other people wrong. And uh, Gordy kind of took a chance on me, like almost, a, you know, it was, it was kind of a favor. You know, but he said, hey, come out and you can practice. You know, I, I, so I drove myself or hopped in with uh, my dad or a, a friend 45 minutes every day uh, to practice. And, you know, the, the deal was, well, you'll practice with the team for the year and you get some ice time and, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get into a couple games. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, uh, I think, uh, you know, I got into 15 games that year and then ended up playing, you know, f you know f four more years of junior A and then, by the end of my junior career, I, I, you know, I led the league in scoring as a defenseman and then, uh, you know, was off to Brown. Yeah. So do you think that that at the end, at the end of the day, when, when that, that happened, do you, do you think that even helped you push yourself even harder and become a better player in, in the end? Sure. Yeah. The easy, the easy answer would have been, you know, make the midget triple A team and hang with my buddies and uh, think we're great hockey players. Uh, this, this was a shot in that shot in the head almost as a wake up call saying, you know, not, not everyone's going to think you as think you're as good as you think you are. Right. And uh, yeah, it inspired me and motivated me and, and definitely, you know, you don't remember, you know, the 10, 11, 12 year old scores of a game, but yeah. you remember something that changes you forever and uh, shapes your path in hockey. Right. And how, so how did, uh, so you played four years of junior, did you play at all that same that same place with that same coach or did you, did you have to? Yeah. So, so another, you know, I, uh, you know, I, uh, my nickname at one point was suitcase suitcase. I, I got traded a couple of times and went through the ringer of the junior hockey experience. And, uh, you know, when I was in the wrong environment, I was a, the small kid, a small defenseman, five foot, you know, seven, five foot eight defenseman, 140 pounds that, you know, you know, everyone trying to turn me into a forward or, turned me into a fourth line checker. You know, I went through the gamut. Right. And I was lucky enough to, you know, go my original coach, Gord Thibodeau end up, you know, going through the, the circuit as a junior coach as well and uh, got hired and fired as well. And he ended up uh, being in Lloyd minister 
and uh, learned from Mr. Alberta, which was a couple hours uh, from my hometown in Edmonton, and end up making a trade for me uh, on my my 19 year old year of, of junior, uh, getting me reunited with Gordy, and that's when it, you know I was at the top of my game at the junior level, and that's when I end up you know I think I had 22 goals and 60 wow. points as a defenseman, and uh, you know that was kind of brand, brought it full circle for both of us. And, you know, we had a great season as a team and, uh, you know, I was able to, you know, have a coach that believed in me and understood the type of player I was. And, uh, you know, it was rare, you know, thinking back then it was, it's more common now, but a five foot nine offensive defenseman, you know, playing in the big bad Alberta junior hockey yeah. where guys are, you know, fighting and trying to run you through the boards every shift. It was, um, you know, I was a unique uh, player, but uh, Gordy recognized that, believed in me, and gave me opportunity. I, I owe him, um, you know, the world for for getting me to Brown. And and then that, so yeah, so that led to you being being recruited to Brown. What made you? Uh, so did Roger recruit you to to Brown? And 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 what? So what made you decide on Brown? And did you feel like Roger had like he had that same like he understood you as a player and, and that kind of stuff as well? Is that has something to do with it? Yeah. So the first first thing that came out was one of their assistants from Brown, uh, Chris Potter, and he came and watched me. And uh, you know they have tough jobs. You know they're going around to all these different rinks, driving these back roads, and there's snow and they're, they're you know I remember him telling me the story of how he you know he had to drive through Saskatchewan to just get to the you know he was just got to the game and uh, saw me and it's a lot about timing, right? They at Brown they were you know, they were going through a transition and uh, challenge, a little challenged offensively and they, they didn't really have any offensive defensemen and, and they felt that was important. And uh, so Coach Potter, Chris Potter came out first, uh, watched me, and then, and then Roger Grillo, who you referred to, was the head coach there and came out to watch me. Um, then they flew me in, uh, af you know, it was after the season, they actually flew me in. So it was late and um, they flew me in. I remember Roger taking me to uh this uh, funny Canadian restaurant in Providence where they had a big moose on the wall and ordered me a big steak and uh, thought that uh, thought that, that I'd feel at home. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so that's a funny story. But, uh, you know, I really, it was really, I had some other schools that were interested, but it was really, you know, a couple things. It was the, the education I knew I could get from Brown, uh, which yeah. was a big, big um, check mark for them. But it was also... You know their care and their their understanding of the type of player I was, and and knowing the need for that type of player in the organization, and feeling that uh, you know I had an opportunity to jump in as a freshman and play right away, and uh, so those are those were the key factors in deciding on Brown, and uh, you know I'm you know I'm very thank thankful to Roger Grill and Chris Potter for getting me there. So so given your given your experience with like like what you went through in midget hockey and junior hockey, and then you know, how things lined up to play collegiate hockey. You know, I know that all the time you talk to parents and kids that want to play college hockey and they're getting a lot of different advice and they don't know, you know, when should, when should they leave youth hockey and when should they go here and when should they go there. And uh, sometimes they get caught up, you know, there's different camps and they don't know who to, who to trust and who to listen to. Um, why don't you give uh, a little bit of your honest kind of take on, junior hockey and, and the hockey world because you know I like to we know that kids within our own program they can come and talk to us and we want to help them and, and we want to help them develop and we're not really like you know like you we always talk about the great part about this job is is you know Paul it being now as a, as a director of our program your job is to do what's best for the kids that you if, if you're not going to get hired or fired based on your win-loss record for a youth hockey team you're trying, your job is trying to do the best for the kids we know that even though um junior hockey and 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 major triple a hockey and stuff out there is still technically youth hockey and supposed to be developmental hockey. That's not necessarily the world, uh, around us. Um, so can you give us a little bit of an insight as far as, um, the kind of the dangers and what's, and what, or what's most important to, sure. to look for and that kind of thing? Well, there's a lot, right. That's a, that's a, that's a loaded question, a load, loaded topic, right. And there, there's so many misconceptions out there and there's so many, um, you know, different paths you can take, right? That's the first thing I would say is that everyone has a different path in hockey and no two paths are the same. You know, my, my path is unique and uh, your path is unique and every other path is unique. So, you know, and you're, you're not done developing, you know, what they say now is 26, 27 years old. So I think that's the first thing to understand to have that growth mindset is that if you truly want to play is that you got to practice and you got to practice the right way and you got to commit to it. And it's got to be a daily commitment, especially when you hit, you know, 15, 16, it's, 
you know, you're making a decision on, is this what you really want to do? Right. So it's, it's not all just show up and practice a couple days a week and I'm going to play college hockey. It's, you know, there's a million, you know, 10 times by 10, 10 million players that are, are doing that. Right. The, it's tough to, it's very tough to play college hockey. It, it's not easy. And, um, you know, I think some of the things that you want to look for, um, you know, even at junior programs or college programs is, is you look for people, you look for their values, what they value. And I think that's the most important thing. When I went to Brown and um, I knew they, they valued me, they cared about me, they wanted me to have success. Um, and, and they really truly felt that I could be a part of it. And, uh, and like the second part I talked about was playing time. I knew I was going to come in and play right away. And, um, you know, there's, there's other programs you can go to where you can sit on the fourth line or the seventh or eighth defenseman and, and win a championship, uh, you know, but how, what's it doing for you, especially at the younger ages, if you're 14, 15, 16, or even younger, um, I I'd say the key is you got to play uh, you got to be in a positive environment, guys that are going to let you play and be yourself and, and play your game. Cause if, if they're going to be, you know, for, especially for me, if, if I had a, if I had a coach when I was younger or uh, in junior where I had to get to the, you know, when I got the puck out of the red line or when I got the puck in our end, I'd have to go off the glass and out and dump it at the red line every time. I wouldn't be the player I would be, was to, uh, you know, for, for a Brown or a professional, I would never would have made it. You know, I was able to handle the puck, make the first pass, jump by a guy, get it back, try to take a guy on one, you know, lead the rush, join the rush late. Those are the things that, are important. You got to know who you are and yeah. you got to, you got to know where you're, what you're getting into. Cause, and, and I'm a great lesson of getting into things that didn't fit. And uh, there was times when I got into junior that I didn't fit there. And there's yeah. times when I got into pro where I didn't fit either. And uh, no question, it's tough to trust uh, the people, but you got to really do your research on the programs and the type of people and, and understand what they're there for. And uh, junior hockey is tough because it's they're they're kind of uh, some some programs are there to develop players and some there are to win at all costs, right? And um, that that's the challenge is that we know I, I know if I'm a I'm a statistic of of junior coaches. I was fired because uh, of our win loss record, and uh, you know I was trying to develop our players and develop our 16 year olds and 17 year olds and and felt they deserved to play some, over some of the 20 year olds. And, uh, you know, that, that cost cost me my job, but it's, uh, you know, those are the things that you have to know going in is that you got to play number one, you got to be in the right environment. Number two. And if you don't have those, it's, it, you're going to be a, a statistic and you're going to be bounced around and, uh, you're going to be looked at another number. And it's, it's not, uh, if we, if we think you thought he's cruel, wait till you get to junior and college and pro it's, it's tougher. What can you give us some, some details on more details on the right environment? What, like what's, what, what kind of environment is, should a player be looking for, for at a junior program? And what, if it's easier, what, what is, what's red flags and what are things to, to ask questions or just to avoid if you see? Sure. Well, I think, I, I think if you're able to, is to go watch a, a coach, coach a game. I know obviously that's not as easy for some people in programs, but watch how the, the coaches interact with the players. You know, we, we talk about when we're recruiting pl uh, um, players, how, how the college coaches watch the players, how they interact with their teammates and the coaches. And it should be, it's vice versa, right? Watch how a coach handles a kid make a mistake. You know, does he scream and yell at them? Does he, you, what does he do? You know, you can see that right away. And the, you're, you're looking for a teacher. Uh, you know, what I would say is you're looking for someone that's going to teach the game and support you and uh, your ups and, down, ups and downs and understand that there's going to be mistakes. And if he's, if they're really in it for the development and the growth of the program and the players, mm -hmm. um, they're going to, they're going to talk to you like an adult, but they're going to be firm, but fair, but they're going to respect you. And they're going to give you that, you know, leeway to, to play the game. And, and what I see a lot nowadays is that, you know, the kids getting stifled by, you know, the coaches that are controlling everything and, 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 you know, screaming and yelling and, and shattering kids' confidences. And, and the confidence is such a big thing, especially at a younger age, right? And it's, it's so easy to lose that confidence if you're 15, 16, 17 years old. So you're, you're looking at, you know, the program at some, some a program that has, you know, I'd say uh, a history of, of generating and developing players and, and, some longevity in doing that because not all programs are 
are like that, right? You, you, you know, they, they may use some smoke and mirrors on, you know, they send kids to higher levels, but you know, do they truly, you know, talk to the people that have been there, you know, before I went to Brown, I talked to some of some former players. I just got their numbers and called them and say, Hey, this is, you know, Paul Esdale, I'm a recruit for Brown. Uh, how, how do you like it there? What do you think about this? And I, and the great thing about hockey is when guys were coming to Brown, I did the same thing for them. Right. So I paid it back. Right. So those are, those are the things you got to really, really vet your programs and your coaches. Cause it's, it's a two way street, right? If you're not in the right environment, it's going to be a long, you know, couple a year or four years in college. So, and so better, better to play for a, a team that, that that maybe is uh, lower in the standings, or or as a 15, 16, 17 year old kid at a junior or something, even a lower lower division or lower league, if it's going to be a better situation and environment. I think no question. I think it. I to be honest, the, the record doesn't matter at all. Yeah. If you're on the worst place team, uh, that might be a good thing because yeah. you're probably going to play more. And when scouts do come see your team, they're going to notice you. And uh, I played on some last place teams. I played on some first place teams and I played on some middle of the pack teams. And uh, I think that, that, you know, kind of record in the youth and junior hockey is really overrated. You know, if you're good enough, they're going to find you. No question about it. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, and, 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 and if you keep getting better too, I guess, right. That's the other thing is that it's where you are that the start of that 16 year old season is not the, the most important thing is how good, how good you get. Right. Cause if you want to play college hockey at 20 years old, you know, uh, you still got three or four years of, of, of work to do. And that, that can make a huge difference between 16 and 20 years old. I mean, you've probably seen a lot of guys pass and fall off between those ages, right? Sure. sure. And the famous quote is it's it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? Your hockey career. So it's it's a long, long, long haul, right? And if you're in it for, you know, the the majority of what you want to do in your life, and if you want to commit to it, you know, there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road, right? And the, the key thing is if, if you're playing in the right environment, you're going to get better. And, and the last kind of thing I forgot to tell you or mention was that one of the most undervalued skill is, and, and something that nobody talks about and so undervalued is making your teammates better. You know, and, and I've said this, I think I've told you this before, but when Wayne Gretzky got traded to the LA Kings, he didn't complain about it. He made, you know, guys like Bernie Nichols, a 70 goal scorer. You know, that's an extreme parallel, but it's so true. Like if, if you can go to a team and make them better, you don't think people notice that? Of course, at the higher levels, they see that. What? Look at this guy. He's a leader. They just got beat 13 nothing, and he's ha- he's got his head held high. He played to the buzzer. He's cheering on his teammates. That's that's called character, and that's that's the difference between, um, you know, playing you playing college hockey and the next guy. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's great, Paul. I, we're about uh, – over 30 minutes in here. I think, uh, I think we may wrap this one up. Sure. The first one I wanted to kind of talk about some of those topics. I think that was great. And then we'll get into some, uh, some sports science and, uh, some, some player curriculum and, and things like that. And some future calls, anything, any final comments or anything for this call? No, just, uh, thanks for the time, Ben. I think this is a great way to, uh, chat about things and, and, uh, you know, like, like you said, learn from other people as well and, uh, you know, get the message out there that, uh, that how important youth hockey is and hockey in general, if it's done the right way. And uh, I know, uh, you know, I've been uh, honored to be part of the Wildcats the last four years because I know uh, it's, it's the, the right program and doing the right things for kids. And, uh, and I'm here to give back to the game and uh, you know, that's what we're passionate about and uh, I'm glad to be a part of it and uh, look forward to more of these. Awesome. Thanks Paul. And if any, anyone that's watching this in the future, um, we're going to be setting up a bunch of these on different topics. If you want to set one up with us and just chat about any topic, uh, just send us over an email. And we're happy to do so as well. Uh, okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.